everyone. Welcome to uh, part one of three on the skeletal system. Um, so this lab, uh, we're going to be focusing on the skull and the vertebrae, uh, as well as some introductory materials. Uh, just as a reminder, if you uh, have downloaded your um, skeletal system models labeled document, um, you can use that as a not only as a way to find all the structures when you're studying, but also you can cover up all the different answers and, and quiz yourself as well. Now, uh, what we want to get started with is, uh, and I'm going to just describe these verbally. Uh, these are not something in the lab that I'm going to test on. I do test on these in my lecture. Our structure sheets do not actually give descriptions of them, so I do discuss them. Long bones, uh, short bones, flat bones, irregular bones, sesamoid bones, and sutural bones. These are types of classifications of bones. Now, a lung bone, for example, is a bone that has a shaft with two wide ends at each end. Uh, a short bone would be something like a boxy bone, like a, a, a wrist bone or an ankle bone. Flat bones are bones that are very thin, like the sternum or ribs. Irregular bones are sh uh, bones with no particular shape, like the vertebrae. Uh, sesamoid bones are actually shaped like sesame seeds, for example, your kneecaps or patella. And the sutural bones are an unusual group of bone that forms being surrounded by sutures. Uh, they're called warmer in bones as well. We'll talk about that a little bit in lecture. Um, for those of you guys who also have me for lecture, but uh, beyond that, that'll be a lecture thing. Now, what we do want to discuss real quick is there's actually two types of what we refer to as bone tissue. There's compact bone and spongy bone. Now, a compact bone uh, has a different uh, buildup than spongy bone. And we'll talk in lectures about that, how spongy bone is built up on trabeculae um, and your compact bone are built up on osteons. Uh, but they do contain a mineral component called hydroxyapatite. And basically this is formed from a chemical reaction with calcium hydroxide, um, calcium phosphate molecules as they react to help form this very strong mineralized crystalline substance which actually makes the matrix of bone. This is why bone is so hard, is it has a material in it called hydroxyapatite. Now, the osteon in lab, we saw this. You guys would have seen this on your test, uh, where I tested on one of the structures of the osteon itself. So we talked about how there were osteocytes. These were chambers. Uh, they were cells that are found in chambers called laguna. Uh, the canaliculi are small canals that allow the access of nutrients and materials to the lacuna and their osteocytes. The central canal at the middle called a haversian canal um, because this is also called the haversian system. And haversian system here is um, built around the central canal with rings called concentric lamellae. And we talked about this in, in, in lab uh, more in detail, so this is something I remind you guys of the structure of this. But again, we've already tested on this in histo section. This would be something you'll talk more about in lecture. Now, what I do uh, uh, have on this exam is, now the exams from here on out from my labs follow a different kind of setup. They, all, they, they won't be as many multiple choice questions as histo. Uh, normally what I do is, a, is 30 identifications and 20 multiple choice questions. And some of the things I'm going to ask on multiple choice, uh, but I am debating about um, doing 40 identification and just 10 multiple choice. So I will tell you for sure by third recording exactly. Since I've been toying with making some changes, it's a good time to do it. Now, there was two divisions of your skeleton. And you can see in here in the diagram from our textbook, the yellow part, this is the axial skeleton found in the center of the body, the body's axis. And here we have an axial skeleton removed. There are 80 bones present. Now, a majority of them 
are coming from the ribs and vertebrae, of course. I mean, there's a bunch in the skull. You have uh, the skull. We'll look at its breakdown. And we'll look at the appendicular skeleton with its 126. Now, the axial 80 is easy to remember. Axial 80. Appendicular is 126. 126 is a very peculiar number. 126 appendicular. Now, that has a lot of that is the fact that most of the, uh, the appendicular skeleton you have two for the price of one. Uh, so two, uh, two humeruses, two radius and ulna, two of each carpal, two of each of the phalanges, uh, two, uh, two coxals, two, um, two femurs, two tibias, two fibulas, two tarsal bones of each, and two um, phalanges on the feet of each bone. So that's why there are so many because there are two for the price of one. Plus the bones like the scapula and the clavicle and things that hold the arms on. So you have a lot of bones there. So what we're going to look at throughout this is first our axial skeleton. And we can see the axial skeleton is made up of your skull and its associated bones. Uh, and then the thoracic cage and vertebral column. And that all kind of breaks down there. Now, what I want to do is to go through this and to uh, look at first the skull and its 22 bones. The skull is actually broken down into two components, the face and the cranium. Now, we're going to start with the cranium, work our way to the face, then we'll see some associated bones later on. Now, I do not have right now the auditory ossicles and the hyoid. Um, I'll have to add that to a separate video uh, I have to check the skull, the skeleton out of the lab during COVID, so uh, things may be a little bit dis more disjointed than I prefer it to be, but you have to request them, and it's a process. Anyway, uh, so we'll start with the skull. We'll look at each thing, and here's all some different images, and then what I'm going to do is, is break down each and every structure, okay? So let's go bone by bone here and look at it and look. Um, so you have diagrams that are all together. We're going to start with the bone called the frontal bone. Now, as I get started, we're going to look for the frontal bone first. So here we are. Let me make sure that my camera here. So the frontal bone on this model, uh, one of the common uh, types of skull models used. So here we have the back, we have our cranial region, and we have our frontal bone here. Frontal bone uh, is going to be located. I just forgot how easily this comes off. Um, they're really only held together through some very weak magnets, and sometimes these magnets are opposite poles and sometimes they are not opposite poles and they actually repel each other and I may have just gotten one of those by mistake yep I got one who's opposite pole uh, or the same pole so they're repelling um, so I have a, a frontal bone here now the frontal bone has a variety of structures that I'm going to want you guys to find so let's go through and look at these structures now first off we're going to about the supra orbital margin now one of the questions I will ask on an exam is for you guys to match a structure like uh, these words here that are underneath the bone to the bone so let's look at supra orbital margin and supraorbital notch, frontal squamous and lacrimal fossa. Supraorbital margin. Now, what is this name telling me? Supra means above. Orbital, what is this in reference to? The eye orbit or eye socket. So we're looking for a margin above that. And right here you could see a line coming across called the supraorbital margin is the line that goes across the brow ridge here that's above the eye supra orbital margin now next on our list of things was super orbital notch now on this model super orbital notch is not very well visible barely visible right here super orbital notch bar uh, barely visible and in fact i'm going to zoom in a little bit here 
and you can barely see the notch, just barely visible here, is a supraorbital notch. Now, the supraorbital notch, again, telling me that it is above the eye orbit and it's a notch. Um, the frontal squama. Frontal squama is the portion of the front of, of the forehead here, uh, the smooth, flattened area of our forehead called the frontal squama. Okay, frontal squama. And lastly, our lacrimal fossa. Now, lacrimal fossa is in reference here that we are discussing. It's, it's associated to a gland called the lacrimal gland. That's where your tears are made. So we want to first to orient is look in our eye socket, then go superior and lateral. And right here, superiorly and laterally, you will see a structure, this pit here is the lacrimal fossa. Fossa is a word that means pit or shallow impression in indentation, okay, in a bone. So that uh, with frontal bone are superorbital margin, superorbital notch, frontal squama, and lacrimal fossa. So those are the structures you are responsible for with the bone itself as well. Now, a lot of times I may tag the bone, but I'm also going to come in and tag a lot of structures. Now, here you could see diagrams showing you guys all this as well. Uh, a lot of times disarticulated so you could see some of the pieces. Now, let's look at the parietal bones. There are two of them. There's a left one and a right one. Now, behind our frontal, we have two parietal bones. Now, facing it this way, we have our right and our left parietal. This would be facing uh, this side here, right. This side here, left, this is this is the interior front end here, the right and the left parietal bones, and there are two of them. They form a huge part of the top of the skull going backwards. Now, luckily, on that one, that's all we needed to know was the two parietals purely for identification. Now, the first bone that we see with a real a lot of information on it is occipital. Now, the occipital bone, uh, occiput, uh, it is found at the back of the skull here, uh, is the occipital bone. So here we are seeing an occipital bone here, occipital bone. And the occipital, forming that base of the skull and bottom, is seen all the way down to here. Actually, ends right here. Now, we are going to take a look at it. In some detail, and the first thing that we're going to find, what I like to do anyway, is I am going to mention the names. We're going to see an external occipital crest, internal occipital crest, occipital condyles, the foramen magnum, hypoglossal canal, and the jugular foramen. Now, we're going to start with the external occipital crest. Now, in anatomy, we don't use words we don't need. So if there's an external something, there must be an internal something. The external occipital crest, a crest is a line. You would find it coming from this big hole all the way back here. External occipital crest. And I was trying to turn it so the shading would catch it. External occipital crest. Now, if there's an external occipital crest, there must be an internal. So I'm going to take the skull apart here. And we're going to look inside and find an internal occipital crest here. Internal occipital crest found here as well. So the internal and external occipital crest. Remember, in anatomy, we don't use words we don't need. So if there is an internal, there's an external. If there's an external, there's an internal. The occipital condyles. So next, we want to turn to the bottom of the skull again. We'll look at the inferior surface, the bottom of the skull. To orient yourselves, you want to find the big hole again. Now, I will name this big hole in a minute. But on both sides of the big hole, there are these two little things that look like rocking chairs here. Looks like the bottom of a rocking chair. And these are the two occipital condyles. Condyles are smooth articular surfaces these are the occipital condyles and found on both sides of the big hole all right 
Now let me help you guys uh, with the next one, the frame and magnum. So we've been using the front, this term big hole. Well, hole in anatomy is a foramen. And this certainly is a foramen, but you notice this is the biggest one in the skull. So it is called the foramen magnum. Magnum meaning that it's large in diameter. You know, think about a magnum revolver. That's the size named after a large uh, wine bottle. Uh, this is the foramen magnum. So foramen magnum, the big hole in the skull. Foramen magnum. The foramen magnum... And then our hypoglossal canal. Now, to find hypoglossal canal, what is going to be convenient for us to do is to, again, find the uh, foramen magnum and occipital condyles. Underneath the occipital condyles here, there will be a hole called the hypoglossal canal. And the hypoglossal canal is, of course, for a nerve to pass through here called the hypoglossal nerve as it passes down into the neck. Uh, as it goes down into the neck a little bit is hypoglossal. Uh, and, and we'll talk more about that later on, the hypoglossal nerve, uh, cranial nerve number 12. <clears throat> All right. And then lastly is the jugular foramen. Let me help you guys find the jugular foramen. Now, the jugular foramen, as this name implies, is associated to the jugular vein, specifically the internal jugular vein. Here we have our occipital bone. We have the occipital condyles. And right here next to this is a bean-shaped hole. And it's got this flat kind of compressed structure to it on both sides right here. These holes that have that compressed shape, that is, uh, the uh, veins can get squashed very flat. So this is the jugular foramen on each side, jugular foramen. Now, we'll talk about the carotid canal in a little bit, and uh, it is associated to it in close proximity. So, now with the occipital bone, we've been able to find the external occipital crest, internal occipital crest, occipital condyles, uh, foramen magnum, hypoglossal canal, and the jugular foramen, as is uh, the list on our structure sheets. Now, there are things that normally I used to always teach, like the external occipital protuberance, and I'm sad they took some of those things off. Um, but uh, the structure sheets appear to have removed those. Uh, so I uh, had to edit some of those things out of, my, out of my models. And then I forgot to remove it from the diagram here that I had because uh, they used to always be on the structure sheets. Um, so if they're, uh, so what I do is follow the structure sheets as we uh, are to teach. So um, anyway, what we want to look at, and there's some diagrams for reference. Our next set of things we're going to find together is the temporal bone and we're going to find the structures on it we'll find two uh, a, a couple different things that are difficult to find um the squamous portion not so hard but the two things that are one of the things is hard to find is the zygomatic process uh kind of difficult at first because it doesn't make any sense zygomatic process of the temporal bone attaches to the zygomatic bone one we're going to learn later on Mastoid process will be very easy to find. Styloid process, if you can find those two, you'll find the stylomastoid foramen very easily. The carotid canal, a mandibular fossa, the external and internal acoustic meatus. Remember, if there's an internal, there must be an external. We don't use words in anatomy we don't need. And the petrous portion. Now, given that, what I want you guys to learn is uh, now how to find these. So let's go and start finding squamous portion. The squamous portion, and where is the temporal bone? Now the temporal bone is right here at the side of the head, the temple. So here is the temporal bone seen on the outside going over here and down a little bit. But this is the temporal bone. And notice that it has a smooth, flat portion to it. This smooth, flat portion on the side of our head is called the squamous portion. 
hence squamous, remember flat, like the simple squamous or simple uh, squamous, stratified squamous, stratified squamous, uh, epithelium, flattened, zygomatic process. Now, we are dealing with the temporal bone. That means it's on the temporal bone. So here it is. Now, it's processing towards this bone here called the zygomatic. I'll talk about it again. But this is the zygomatic process of the temporal bone seen here. <clears throat> now, also our mastoid process. Mastoid process, very large, right here on the side of the skull is the mastoid process. Very easy to find here, mastoid process. Now, the next structure on our list is going to be found in close proximity to that. And that is our uh, styloid process. Now, remember, a stylus is a structure kind of like what I'm using to point with is something. Uh, now, this is just a, a folded paper clip. I do have like an official stylus that one might use to try to write with on something but here we have like a stylus so the styloid process is this very pointy one here so mastoid and styloid now because we have found the styloid process and the mastoid process i'm going to take the skull top off for ease of viewing and zoom in a second and find again our styloid and our mastoid process. And right here, there's a hole located between the two of them. Between the styloid process here and the mastoid process there called the stylomastoid foramen. Stylomastoid foramen. And the stylomastoid foramen found on both sides, of course, there's one here styloid mastoid again as you can see them now the goal here is to always try to use a structure you already know something easy to find and use that to find the next thing now after we find the styloid uh styloid mastoid foramen we're we're going to turn our attention to the carotid canal now to find the carotid canal we want to return back to one we've already found here structure here called the jugular foramen here and here and uh, directly anterior to it here and here are the carotid canals now in these models they're not all the way through it actually is filled in with plastic in the real skull it would not be it'd be open this thing goes up into the skull so carotid canals here and here anterior to the jugular foramen here now, next we want to turn our attention to the mandibular fossa. Now, on my model, the mandibular fossa, this is where the mandible or jawbone articulates and fits in. Now, get on mine, they are these cups, these rubbered cups that the uh, that this fits in called the now because it's on the temporal bone and the mandibular fossa here helps to form the articulation with the mandible. We actually call this the temporal mandibular joint, or TMJ. So that's where you get TMJ, uh, jaw pain, stuff like that. Uh, mandibular fossa. Now we want to find the external and internal acoustic meatus, or canal. The external acoustic meatus, how do we want to find that? Find our... Mastoid process, and anterior to that is our external acoustic canal or meatus. Now, we have to go inside the skull to find the internal acoustic canal or meatus. We want to look for inside here, we want to look at this ridge shaped part of the temporal bone. And there's a hole there, here and here. These holes are referencing our, showing us our internal acoustic meatus on each side. Internal acoustic meatus. Now, Petrus portion is where we found this. The Petrus portion is this part of the skull right here. Temporal bone has this portion called Petrus, P-E-T-R-O-U-S. 
Petrus portion. Petrus. Petrosal. Uh, the Petrus portion is a um, um, uh, dealing with uh, some descriptions here uh, Petrosal and uh, what it is uh, it actually gets its name from rock or stone um, it, uh, it looks like a rock or a stone it kind of looks a little bit like a mountain range in here and that's where it gets its name, okay? Like a mountain range, Petrosal, Petrus. Okay, <clears throat> now that is our temporal bone. Now the temporal bone is also one of those bones where there's a lot going on. The, uh, the temporal and the occipital tend to be some of the hardest bones for us to learn as students at this level course. Now, the next one is the sphenoid. Now, we, uh, the structure sheets remove some of the foramen that we used to cover, um, but uh, we're going to see on the sphenoid bone, we'll see a cell of tersica, lesser and greater wings, pterygoid processes, superior and inferior orbital fissures, and optic canal, or an optic foramen. Now, as we go to find the sphenoid bone, one of the first places to look for it is right here on the side of the skull right here sphenoid let me zoom out just a little bit to help you guys here find it sphenoid it goes on down and you can find it actually down here as well okay now the sphenoid the first structure that we saw on our sphenoid bone that we were to locate was the cella tersica it means turkish saddle so if you think about a person riding a horse, it looks like a saddle, a Turkish saddle. So it looks like uh, somebody had in, in, uh, in Turkey, we're going to be riding on their horse. They might have a saddle that has a different shape than typical English tack. And that's called the cella tersica or Turkish saddle. Now, the cella tersica here, Turkish saddle, it actually holds the pituitary. Now, the lesser and greater wings looks like on a bat. The lesser wings are the upper wings here that are going to be at the top part of the sphenoid. Lesser wings. And the greater wings form the floor of the sphenoid bone down here. Greater wings. Greater wings, lesser wings. The pterygoid processes will best be seen from an inferior view. So I'm going to turn the skull over now and look at this from the bottom. Now you guys can actually go and check out a skull and follow along with me. What you're going to see is if you find these, th this is the hole coming from the sinus cavities into the mouth, and there's these rows of, two rows of bone here. Uh, there's actually medial and lateral ones, and these are the pterygoid processes. Uh, these are the pterygoids, sometimes called os pterygoideus or pterygoids, pterygoid processes. There's lateral ones and medial ones, but you do not have to know the difference between the medial and the lateral pterygoids. Now, superior orbital fissure and inferior orbital fissure. Again, this references our eye socket. That means part of the sphenoid can be seen through the eye socket. A fissure is an elongated cleft or slit. So there is an elongated cleft or slit at the top called the superior orbital fissure and one at the bottom called the inferior orbital fissure again inferior orbital fissure and superior orbital fissure uh, of the sphenoid bone best seen viewed through the eye socket and lastly the optic canal or foramen again best seen through the eye socket right here we have our superior orbital fissure and here's the optic canal or foramen here and here now, if we put this inward, we would actually see that the nerves that would come in would cross right here, right at where the pituitary is, 
And that's what happens is your nerves do cross at the pituitary gland. Um, now that means if you want to get to the pituitary, typically they go through the roof of the mouth to try to get up through the sphenoid. Uh, they go up through the roof of the mouth and try to come into this uh, from the bottom of the cell tersica to try to do surgery on your sphen uh, on your pituitary. Now that concludes our sphenoid bone. So the sphenoid bone, here's some diagrams to help you guys navigate everything where I've taken the diagrams and pulled each bone out so you can see the structures. Now next we're going to see the ethmoid. Now the ethmoid, complicatedly enough, can be seen from a variety of views. Internally inside the skull, through the eye socket, on the side of the skull, and even through the nose it can be seen. And uh, what I wanted to talk about here is the Christogalli, the cribriform plate, the olfactory foramina, perpendicular plate, and the middle nasal conchi. Uh, now, as we go to look for these, let's start off with the ethmoid. The ethmoid bone, as I said, it can be seen through the eye socket, actually seen right here and here. It can be seen on the um, a little bit, um, sorry, from the inside of the skull here. I don't know why I was about to try to show it on the side of the skull. You can see it from the uh, uh, nose, a little bit of it here, and then also inside the skull as well, found here. Now, the first structure that we actually have listed is the Crista Galli. Crista Galli is going to, I want you guys to think, of like a, think about a shark. Think about a shark. And it looks like a shark's fin sticking out of the water here. It's the Crista Galli. Let me zoom in a little bit. And here we have the Crista Galli. It's seen from the side. It looks like a little shark fin. It's called the Crista Galli, which separates the two halves of the ethmoid in the part of the skull found on the inside anterior part. Now, the crib reform plate is the crib that cradles the olfactory nerves on each side here. So these are the crib reform plates. On each side of the Crista Galli are the crib reform plates. And in the crib reform plates are multiple tiny holes called olfactory foramina. And actually on my diagram here on this real skeleton, you could see the olfactory foramina, all the little holes that are in it, very well here. So the olfactory foramina uh, are also seen being depicted as multiple pits on this model. Now, as well, the perpendicular plate. Now, we will find perpendicular plate by looking through the nose, through the nasal aperture. And what you're going to find is our perpendicular plate of the ethmoid forms the upper part of the nasal septum, where the inferior part of nasal septum is actually made of another bone called the vomer. So this is your perpendicular plate of ethmoid. Ending about here on our model, it does, we don't have a suture being drawn there showing its end. And then middle nasal conchi, or concha, is associated as well. Uh, now, there is a superior not visible on the model. The superior is not visible. It would be up here. So this is the middle. We have an inferior one here. This is the middle. The superior is not depicted. So this is the middle nasal conchi on each side. Another name for those is turbinates. Uh, these ridges found on the lateral aspects of the nasal aperture help to uh, produce swirls of air as you inhale through your nose. So that is our ethmoid. Now, the uh, so basically what we have done is gotten through the cranium in a pretty good order here is with the ethmoid. Now, cranial bones are held together st through structures 
called sutures. Now, these sutures are going to be dyed uh, and colored orange on my model. Uh, we're going to start with the coronal suture, sagittal suture, lambdoid suture, and squamous suture. Now, coronal suture was first. You've probably heard the old um, uh, nursery rhyme, uh, Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Uh, Jack fell down and broke his crown. And Jill came tumbling after. When Jack fell down and broke his crown, he probably broke his coronal suture. Jack has a subdural hematoma and probably needs a borehole to remove the intracranial pressure. Poor Jack. This suture here is the coronal suture. Remember, a coronal section or plane separates the body front to back. Separating the frontal bone from the parietals is the coronal suture. Now, Next one is sagittal suture. Remind yourselves that sagittal plane and section separate the body left from right. So separating the left and the right parietal is the sagittal suture. Down the middle, separating the left and right parietal is the sagittal suture. The lambdoid suture, named after the Greek letter lambda, uh, which looks like an upside down Y, here, and you can see that, here we have the occipital bone, and separating occipital from parietals is the lambdoid suture. Looks like lambda here with the, so you see a peace sign where you see parietal, parietal, occipital, lambdoid suture, sagittal suture coming together at a confluence. All right, and lastly is the squamous suture. Now, squamous suture, remember, we had a bone on the skull that had a squamous portion. Frontal was one of them, but the other one was called the temporal bone. The squamous portion of temporal bone here, just above it, superior to it, is the squamous suture because of its proximity to squamous portion of temporal bone. So one of the things I always reference all my students to do is, again, to relate structures to other structures they've already learned. Okay. All right. So that completes our sutures, which means we now want to turn our attention here to the uh, uh, facial bones. And most of that will be done on, on, on just a few slides. Uh, the facial bones, there are 14 of those. The zygomatic, uh, which we're going to find. So let's go find the zygomatic. Zygomatic bone, remember, zygomatic bone here is actually here. Now, the zygomatic bone has a temporal process of zygomatic. And let me go back to... Uh, which apparently they've removed from the new structure sheets. Give me one second. Uh, so it is on the structure sheets. I went ahead and added it back. Uh, I don't know if it got removed for some reason when I rewrote my notes. But they are in the structure sheets. Um, so uh, let me um, um, make sure you guys can locate this. So again... We have the zygomatic bone and its temporal process attaches to the zygomatic process of, tem of temporal bone. And the zygomatic bone has a temporal process of zygomatic bone. And those attach to each other and it forms what we refer to as the zygomatic arch. Now, as well, we have our maxilla. Uh, there are going to be a few structures on the maxilla we want to look at, infraorbital foramen alveolar processes or margins, and palatine processes. Now, we'll start by finding the maxilla. The maxilla is your upper jaw, maxilla. 
So this is the part of the face here that holds your upper teeth is the maxilla going all the way up to the nose and all the way down here on both sides of those. Two of those down the middle here is our maxilla. Now the maxilla, remember our first structure that we're to identify here is our infraorbital foramen. Now infraorbital referencing it's below the eye orbit. So again, find the eye orbits. Find a foramen under the eye orbit here and here. And you will note they go up into the eye socket. Those are infraorbital foramen. Now we want to find the alveolar processes or margins. Very important when it comes to dental hygiene, dental health. I just knocked over uh the skull it, th this one here i i, I picked had to pick the one to add the reverse polarity magnet our alveolar margins or processes they are found here where the teeth are locked into the skull so it's the ridges form where the teeth lock in so find the teeth and you find the alveolar margins or processes Next, uh, we will find the palatine processes. Now, I'm going to tell you why they're called palatine real quick. This bone right here is the palatine bone, but this is part of the maxilla. These are palatine bones, and these parts of the maxilla are attached or processing towards this, like how there was a temporal process of the zygomatic bone and a zygomatic process of the temporal bone, there is a palatine process of the maxilla that are attaching to the palatines. So these are the palatine processes, okay, uh, found on forming the bulk of the roof of the mouth. Now, the palatine bones are posterior to the uh, palatine processes, or the palatine bones. Now, the palatine bones, sorry, I clicked the wrong thing there. The palatine bones, again, are here posteriorly and attaching to the palatine processes. <clears throat> Now, lacrimal bone and its only structure we learn, nasolacrimal canal. Now, the lacrimal bone will be best seen in the eye socket. Looking at the medial side of the eye socket is our lacrimal bone here and here. Now, the lacrimal bone does have one structure on my model is missing. Should be down here, like a little pit. It should be somewhere about here. Going downwards into the nasal cavity. Not very, not visible on this model. Um, that is the problem. It's not all models actually depict everything. And the nasal lacrimal canal was missing. The nasal bones, which are associated to the bridge of the nose. If you break your nose, you're probably breaking these bones here or those associated to it. And those are your nasal bones, the two here, a left one and a right one. And they're here forming the bridge of the nose, the bony part of the nose, not the soft cartilaginous tissue that makes up the rest of the nose. The inferior nasal conchi, which uh, should be easy for us to find because we know the middle nasal conchi here, we saw the middle here, middle nasal conchi. So our inferior nasal conchi at the bottom here. And here. The which is considered its own bone. The vomer, which is found also kind of complicated in its in its way it's built up. You can find it here at the tip of the nose, coming out of the tip of the nasal aperture, the bottom part, the most inferior part of the perpendicular plate. Uh, or the, uh, sorry, the most inferior part of the nasal septum is actually the vomer. And then the vomer can also be seen right here is the vomer. This is your vomer. Okay, that's the vomer. Also seen back here behind where the nasal cavity comes in. Because remember, it forms the bottom part of that as it sneaks inward 
and comes out, it bisects and it moves. Uh, it starts out the bottom and moves upwards and comes out like this. Okay, up at an angle. All right, uh, and the mandible, uh, which uh, I appear to have, uh, um, uh, that I will talk more about it uh, here in just a little bit, uh, but we'll talk about the mandible and its anatomy in a minute. So here we have the mandible. Now, I will discuss it more in detail momentarily. All right. Now what we want to look at, so the zygomatic bone did have a temporal process, and sorry that I was for some reason putting it in its own slide and just didn't realize that uh, uh, after I've edited my notes, I wanted to show those, and I, that was my fault for missing that. I, I thought I left it out, but I didn't. I had put it here for some reason by itself. Um, <clears throat> the mandible, uh, we are going to see the body, the angle, the rami, the coronoid processes, the condylar processes, the mandibular notch, the alveolar processes or margin, the mental foramen, and mandibular foramen. Now, we're going to start with body of the mandible. Now, body of the mandible is just basically the bulk of what the mandible is. Uh, the bulk of that uh, mandible is the body. And the body forms the bulk of this lower jaw, okay? Now, the body of the mandible, oh yeah, okay, the body of the mandible here is only so much of it, and then there will be the angle of the mandible. Now, the angle of the mandible, as you'll see, is this portion here, and the angle of the mandible right here, the reason there is an angle is there's this structure here called the ramus, which is an extension of a bone that forms an angle with that bone. So this extension forms the ramus of the mandible. Okay? And that should be, if memory serves me right, the next structure is the ramus, the rami. And they are on both sides, of course, so there's one over here as well. Here we have the angle of the mandible. And again, the extension that forms that is the ramus. The next on our list is the coronoid processes and the condylar processes. The coronoid processes are these guys here. They're the ones that help to pull the jaw up and down so that somebody can talk too much and you get annoyed. It's the one that pulls the jaw up so that you can get annoyed at them for running their mouth. Coronoid. Coronoid. Now here we have the condylar process because it holds the condyles. So condylar processes on both sides, coronoid processes on both sides. All right, and then lastly, we look at some things like the mandibular notch. And that's the space between the two of these. As you can see here, the notch between the coronoid and condylar processes. So it is this thing here, the mandibular notch, here, and of course, here. Here and here. <clears throat> Bilateral structures means both sides. And then uh, our alveolar processes or margins. These are, again, where the teeth lock in. So we find the teeth and the ridges where the teeth lock in are the alveolar margins or processes. The mental foramen, the mental region, remember, is your chin. So right here we have the mental foramen on our chin here and here. Okay? These mental is your chin. When, think, when you're thinking really seriously, you might stroke your chin. You might hold your chin when you're thinking really seriously, really stuck in some mental thought. And last one is the mandibular foramen. Go to the back of the mandible, looking here, here, 
and here for the mandibular foramen here and here on both sides okay all right and that gets us the mandible and all of its things now we also want to talk about the bones of the eye orbit now this would be a multiple choice question on my test that i might ask and that would be things like your uh your uh, orbital bones or eye orbit bones uh the frontal bone the maxilla zygomatic lacrimal ethmoid sphenoid and palatine um of the bones of the eye orbit now uh there is a good way to remember self pams self pams uh, to help you guys remember, self, S, sphenoid, self, uh, PAMS, self, S, E, ethmoid, S, E, L, lacrimal, F, frontal, self, PAMS, palatine, P, A, maxilla, M, Z, zygomatic, self, PAMS. Self PAMS. One way to remember the eye orbit bones. Okay. Uh, the calvarium is just the top of the skull. It's just what we call the top of the skull, the skull cap. Uh, basically, what it was that fell off and knocked over uh, glass, uh, knocked over something in my uh, home recording studio here. Um, is this? That's the calvarium. Oops. The calvarium is just the top of the skull, skull cap, okay, calvarium. And then also I want to talk about paranasal sinuses. The paranasal sinuses, these are uh, uh, hollow chambers located in the skull around the nasal cavity. That's the area where it comes out your nose, and they're, they're attached to it and connected to it. And their mucous membranes in there. They're the two frontals here in the forehead. You probably have had uh, sinus pain right above your eye where your eyebrows are. That's pain in your frontal sinuses. Or if you've had it on both sides of the nose below your eye, those are the maxillary sinuses. Then there are sphenoidal sinuses along the bridge of the nose. And then between the eye and the forehead, there are multiple things called ethmoidal air cells, and that's their locations. Now, I could potentially use this diagram to ask you one of the sinuses, or I might say which of these is one of the paranasal sinuses, or is not a paranasal sinus, uh, things like that. <clears throat> okay. Now, the fontanelles, I do not have a model for that. Uh, we do have two of them. These are the soft spots on the skull, the anterior, posterior, sphenoidal, and mastoidal fontanelles, uh, which you could see the, the big one, the anterior, that's the main soft spot to allow the skull to grow. Uh, the sphenoidal, uh, I mean the anterior, the posterior back here, posterior fontanelle. The sphenoidal fontanelles located here. And then the mastoidal fontanelle back here. Now, I am going to have to come back to the hyoid bone and some other bones. I probably should just done skull and associated bones in this video. But basically what happened was I realized I grabbed vertebrae. And I may just actually adjust the title of my video to actually be skull. I uh, kind of wish I had skull and associated bones. Now, with the... Uh, uh, with this guy, the hyoid, we, uh, I, I do have a model that I usually pull out, uh, but you can see with this real one here, the body is this massive part here where there are the lesser horns or lesser cornea and the greater horns or lesser cornea. So, I mean, lesser cornea, greater cornea, greater horn actually attaches to the neck through connective tissues. And then in musculature, etc. And this is where the muscles for speech on the lesser horns. Now, the um, 
auditory ossicles. I will not have you identify them yet on this exam. That'll be an AMP2 thing that have you identify. But you probably will see a multiple choice question potentially on the auditory ossicles, the malus, the incus, and the stapes. The malus, the incus, and the stapes, three very small bones. This thing here is about the size of a silver dollar or so, uh, smaller than a hockey puck. About the size of a silver dollar, uh, this puck, this disc. We have a bunch of these in our lab as well, uh, about five of them. Um, now, uh, what I'm going to do, guys, I do urge you here. See, we've been recording. I do urge you guys to take a small break. Uh, now, the associated bones, uh, we'll try to actually go in with, at least with the hyoid maybe and bring that back in if I if I can get my hands on. But that's really the only one that I'm going to have to worry about that I didn't have a model. I will have a photograph of the models that I have labeled on D2L uh, for you guys to practice with on your exam, kind of like how I did your tissues exam. Uh, same thing here. I'm going to have pictures of bones and say name this bone, name this part of this bone pointed to by the red arrow and things like that. Uh, so go ahead, take a pause of the calls, um, and then we'll come back and finish this part up. Okay, uh, I'm glad you're back. For me, that was actually no time. I just took a breath and then went on. Um, we're going to talk about the vertebral column, which there's 26 bones. Now, of those bones, there's a variable number of certain of them. Now, one of the things you guys will notice is on your structure sheets here – as we go down to this, I, uh, we discuss that uh, some of the numbers of them, uh, we always uh, – um, <clears throat> oh, they have uh, – I guess they did – no, um, okay, they did remove it. Uh, we've always had that. I always asked it, and I always get mad when they take things out and they don't – tell me and it bugs the g willikers out of me uh because it's stuff i always tested on the number of different bones in in the vertebral column um and uh so um anyway uh that's something i always test on uh there are seven cervical vertebrae c1 through c7 12 thoracic t1 through t12 Five lumbar, uh, L1 through L5. Sacral is five few bones. And the coccygeal does vary a little bit depending upon a few factors. A little bit more variable. Uh, I always used to say uh, that cervical thoracic lumbar was breakfast, lunch, and dinner, 7, 12, 5. Eat breakfast at 7 a.m., lunch at 12, dinner at 5. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, 7, 12, 5, 5, 7, 12, 5. 7, 12, 5, 5. Cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral. But the five sacrals are fused together into one bone, basically. Now, typical vertebrae have a few features we want to talk about. Um, <coughs> I actually may have to stop. <laughs> as strained as my voice is starting to get, start, starting to get weak. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering if I'm actually can <laughs> finish all the vertebrae. Um, <clears throat> I tell you what, I will finish the vertebrae and then I will have to stop because I know I can't do any more. Um, so vertebral features, things like body and stuff like that, we're going to talk about. We'll see that all vertebrae have a body, uh, except well, not all vertebrae. C1 does not. Uh, we'll see that they have spinous processes, well, except for again C1. We'll see they have a, a vertebral or neural arch. We'll see they have lamina, pedicles. That they have um, as well as uh, transverse processes, vertebral foramen, superior and inferior articular processes. Superior and inferior articular facets. Okay. Now, let's start uh, with some vertebrae. Now, I'm going to show these as I go through all of them, okay? And with these vertebral features, I'm going to teach this with all of them. And that's something I do want to talk about. Now, also, I want to talk about vertebrae and the intervertebral foramen and intervertebral disc. 
the intervertebral foramen on this model here, this is where the uh, uh, where the uh, different uh, spinal nerves are coming out uh, here. These lumbar nerves are coming out between the vertebrae through what is called intervertebral foramen. Now, the intervertebral foramen, as you're going to see, are produced because the overlap between one vertebrae from above and one vertebrae from above from below produces a hole that these nerves can pass through the intervertebral foramen. Between each vertebrae, there are intervertebral discs made of hyaline cartilage mostly. Or not hyaline, oh, well, there, there is hyaline cartilage there, but mostly fibrous cartilage, mostly. The hyaline cartilage forms the thin outer layer of it, um, vertebral and plates, but the most of it is fibrous cartilage. I apologize for my slip there for a second. All right. Now, what we're going to do is with each vertebrae, uh, we're going to talk about them and their different things. So we're going to start with a cervical vertebrae. So cervical vertebrae, very typical cervical vertebrae, to me looks like a happy pig. Looks like it was a happy pig. And if I look at it here, I mean, doesn't it look very happy? And it looks like a pig. We could see the pig snout, the little piggy snout, his big smiling face, and his little eyes looking at us as a happy little pig. And this is your typical uh, kind of... Uh, kind of um, <clears throat> cervical vertebrae here. Now, cervical vertebrae have oftentimes, can have, and they're the only ones that do have, this thing here called a bifid spinous process. Bifurcated spinous process. Now, this is the spinous process, one of the structures that we discussed. We also discussed the vertebral body, the uh, body of a vertebrae. We discuss at the body here that there is uh, also um, that we have lamina, two lamina come together, and the two lamina and the spinous process form a vertebral arch or neural arch. And then there with the vertebral body produces a vertebral foramen, not intervertebral foramen, but vertebral foramen, sticking out the sides of the transverse processes. And then also there will be superior articular processes. Now this is the top. Uh, spinous processes point downwards. So this is the upper one. This is a superior articular process. And then the smooth area is the superior articular facet. Pointing downwards here, inferior articular process and inferior articular facets. And this forms our vertebrae. Uh, again, we could see that. Now, one of the things I want to mention that only, only these guys have, only cervicals have, is these holes found in the transverse for, uh, processes called transverse foramen. Transverse foramen is found only, 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 only in these guys. Okay. I was double checking my sound. My my headset didn't sound right. All right. Now we want to talk about C1 and C2 vertebrae. C1 the atlas, C2 the axis. Now, just like a cervical, uh, there is atlas and axis are t both cervical vertebrae, and they have some things in common. They have, of course, the transverse foramen. Uh, on them like all of them do. But C1 vertebrae here, the atlas, it's called the atlas because what it does is, is it attaches itself to your world, the skull. Sorry, I had it right the first time. All right, and it attaches to the skull here and allows that so your skull is your world and it holds up the world on its shoulders like Atlas of Greek mythology held the world on his shoulders. So first cervical. Now I do expect my students to recognize a first cervical vertebrae or Atlas C1 
when they see it. And I might have a picture and say, identify this vertebrae and be specific. And what I mean is I want C1 or first cervical, you know, uh, atlas, something like that, C1. Now, C2 is also here, and it has an odontoid process or a dense. So C1, let's look at C2. C2 is called the axis. And it's not hard to see why when we combine these two together and see that it can rotate the atlas on its axis, okay? And it's called the, I don't know what I just did here. <laughs> I just hit something though. Um, <clears throat> oh, cool, I can do that. Somehow I knocked the zoom There we go. <clears throat> okay, so this is C1, and this is the odontoid process or DENS. Uh, sometimes what happens in a patient who has had like a severe neck injury, like they're riding a motorcycle, and their head gets snapped back very quickly, is they will suffer a DENS or odontoid fracture, and this is referred to as a hangman's fracture. To get this, since it's sitting here like that, you'll have to have the patient open their mouth and get the picture taken through the mouth of that. Um, uh, so a hangman's noose attempts to break and snap the odontoid process of C2 or axis. So with its odontoid process. So your typical cervical with a bifid spinous process is the lamina, two lamina come together to make a vertebral arch or neural arch. The pedicle attaches to the body. Transverse processes stick out the side. Transverse foramen found here only on cervical vertebrae. C1 and C2 uh, at the neck. Here's causing, a, a, we call it C1 and C2. We refer to that as a... Um, um, uh, Atlanto axial joint or daddy's little girl's joint because when you ask daddy's little girl brush your teeth no she shakes her head no she comb your hair no brush your hair no do you want to go to bed no daddy's little girl um, the thoracic there are 12 of them and we will see a thoracic vertebrae looks like a giraffe. I say it looks like a thoracic giraffe, and it absolutely does look like a giraffe. I mean, look at it. It's a giraffe. And the thoracic giraffe here, one, a few of the things you guys will notice is, is that uh, very curved spinous processes, very round, uh, very interesting shape vertebral body, very round, smooth vertebral foramen. The superior articular processes go sharply up, and the facets are very flattened. And the inferior articular processes and their facets also very much uh, flattened. But right here, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit, is you can see right here two flattened areas, one here, one here. These are special facets called costal facets. There's also some found here, rib facets here and here for the ribs to articulate with, but those are called transverse costal facets. And these costal facets here allow for the ribs to articulate, and only these vertebrae have it, only thoracic. So, of course, we could see uh, thoracic vertebrae, its body, its pedicles, its lamina forming a neural arch or vertebral arch, spinous process pointing downwards, transverse processes out to the side, superior articular processes and facets forming the uh, little ear, the little horns of the of the giraffe, and down here, inferior articular processes and facets. Remember, this always points down. So our thoracic giraffe. And then lastly is our lumbaring moose. There's nothing on the lumbar that we have to know specific other than it's a lumbar. And I'm going to put these all out here again and remind you that I also expect my students to be able to differentiate a, a normal cervical, 
a normal thoracic and a normal lumbar vertebrae on an exam as well. So here we have a lumbar vertebrae. It makes it look like moose antlers. We see moose antlers. So it's a little moose. It's a lumbaring moose. Very large vertebral body. The pedicles here. Where it has set my little pointer. Your pedicles, your lamina coming together to make a neural arch. Very uh, more straight back uh, uh, spinous processes. Small uh, transverse processes, very deep and wide uh, superior costal facets on the superior, uh, su I mean, superior articular facets. Um, these facets are very uh, 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 wide and better for articulations um, on the uh, superior articular facets. So the superior articular facets here, very deep, pointing up, and the inferior articular processes going down, and interior articular facets facing inwards. These guys are very mobile in comparison to thoracic, who's not mobile. What little bit of space they could wiggle is also kind of limited by the ribs being present. So not the most mobile vertebrae here. Cervical, quite mobile. So cervical... Happy pig, thoracic giraffe, and lumbaring moose. And I would expect you guys to be able to identify a cervical, a thoracic, and a lumbar vertebrae. And let me put these in a position that lets you see my visual mnemonic aids that I was mentioning. Okay? So those are some things I would expect you to be able to do as a student when it comes to the vertebrae. And this does conclude my very first lab uh, lecture on uh, on the bones. I'll be picking up the rest of the uh, axial skeleton. I may actually go ahead and get started on part of the arm as well. It's just that the skull and the vertebrae are a lot. The vertebrae, specifically these structures here, are among the most difficult to learn. Again, please contact my tutor, Christine. I have her... Um, if I don't have her contact info yet, I'm going to go ahead and post it, uh, but I'll give you guys her contact info so that, or, and also Renee Mosley and Christine. So Renee and Christine both will be able to help you guys. Guys, thank you so much uh, for everything. I hope you found this video recording helpful and me pointing to everything. Remember, it's the models label that you're going to be using those pictures to identify everything, but I want to give you as much of this is what it's like to be in a classroom as possible. Guys, thank you, and have a great day, and we'll see you in the next one.